Oh, this is gonna be like therapy. I was born Chad Miller, uh, February 28th, in the late 70s, in a village called Constantine, Michigan. And as you can imagine by village, that means a very, 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 very small town and very secluded. Um, a small community, a farming community. And I was born to a single mother and I was eventually joined by a half-sister three years later. And, and life was just interesting. I didn't have a lot of males in my life in my early years. Uh, my family consisted mostly of females. And I adopted a lot of feminine manner mannerisms. And that would haunt me for years. For years. And as a kid growing up, I, I wanted to play house. I wanted to play dress up. I wanted to play with dolls. And when playing make-believe, I always played as female. Uh, be it a mother, a wife, later on a sister. And as much as some of my family tried to instill boy-like activities for me, it was fine. I didn't dislike boys' toys unless it had to do with like tractors and trailers and and I did have some like matchbox cars, but a lot of it was primarily action figures and then I would play dolls with my sister. This is my Masters of the Universe Origins collection. These are a new generation based on the classic 1980s action figure line. They are very much like the originals, uh, but with better articulation and features, and has been a fun and nostalgic way to collect a lot of the figures that I used to own when I was young. I remember wanting to be Marsha Brady. Marsha Brady was beautiful, she was popular, uh, she was the oldest of the Brady girls, and yeah, I think that's Daphne from Scooby-Doo and Chitara from the Thundercats were some of my favorite television characters to portray. And, oh my gosh, and I forgot Daisy Duke. Oh. Um. <laughs> there wasn't really much of a definition of what boy and girl meant to me growing up. And my mom was hardworking. She was a single parent for the most part. 
And so my sister and I were raised by either family members or babysitters for the most part, as my mom had, you know, her work life and a pretty decent social life. Um, and, and that would cause friction later on in, in the years, but it's been resolved. So, when I started getting teased about wanting to portray a, a female character, um, I, I really didn't understand what the difference was. I recall in grade school um, being on the playground and all my friends were girls. And we would suddenly want to play Super Friends, which is like, for those of you who don't know, is the Justice League cartoon uh, way back when. And the only female on the team was Wonder Woman. And I insisted on being Wonder Woman. I was the only boy in my circle of friends and I had to be the female character. I insisted on it. And it's not like I threw a tantrum or anything if, if it didn't happen. It's just, it's just the way things went and my friends were okay with it. Um, they would bring my little ponies to class and we would play My Little Ponies. Um, so yeah, um, the teasing really, really started, I want to say about third grade. And I remember like the hand clapping thing was a big deal, um, but the boys didn't do that. Um, I remember showing off, one well, of my friends and I showing off some hand claps in front of the class one day and I got teased for that. Um, so yeah, it's, it was interesting. And eventually it got to the point where we moved to the next closest town. Uh, after my fourth grade year and it meant starting a new school, it meant making new friends and it was devastating at first. I didn't know how to really deal with it. So getting adjusted to this new school and finding new friends, I found a friend who was a boy and his name was Jay and we lived in a trailer park and so did Jay and we would, um, he would often come over and we would play uh, with the action figures and and any like Thundercats, which I had to be Chitara. And eventually, Jay grew distant, and this is when I started to discover social cliques. Um, all of a sudden, I wasn't a part of the popular crowd. I was being made fun of. And I wanted to be somebody different. I wanted to be somebody that wasn't me. I even remember trying to say my first name was different than what it is. I went with Mark with the C. Um, 
going to send my papers with Mark, with a C. <laughs> um, but that just didn't do it. And it, it still remained to be a fact that all my female friends were the ones that stood by me. And, and they weren't the popular girls. And I was okay with that. I just wanted friends. And fortunately, uh, living in that town lasted only a year. And we moved on to another town, and I would start middle school there. I literally have no idea of what the word gay even meant, let alone transgender. You know, having done this once already, I wasn't too worried about it. Um, it was, it was tough to adjust to a new school and especially hitting puberty and finding out that, um, your body is changing and it's doing things that nobody is telling you anything about. And... There was an instance in the boys' locker room my sixth grade year um, where a certain bodily reaction happened uh, because it was the first time I was around other boys who were not clothed and That's when the terms gay and faggot came into play, um, as well as a horrendous nickname. And I did find some male friends throughout my middle school years. Um, one of them was very, very much like me. His name was Kirk, and he liked to play with dolls, as well as action figures. And he didn't live too far from me, so it was an easy little walk to either go to his place or him to come to my place. And, and whenever he came over to my place, that's primarily when we played dolls with my sister. And it was this big secret thing, like nobody could know about. And I remember Kirk and I had a falling out, and I told people that he came over to play dolls. And that backfired in my face because I also played with dolls. And so that ruined that friendship. But then I found the drama club, and that was life-changing in so many ways. So back to Drama Club, uh, I, uh, we did two, uh, two versions of a play. Um, it was the same play, uh, just with two different combinations of casting. And it was a period piece uh, based on the life of Sojourner Truth. And I remember my mom concocted this insane looking costume for me. And, I mean, in all aspects, it was fairly accurate for the time. Um, but yeah, I got made fun of for that. Revolve Bellarabi 1810. She was nearly 6 feet 
for acting that really kind of invigorated me. It was something that took me out of at my everyday woes. And I think it's based on my love of TV and film and playing make-believe and pretending to be something I'm not or something I couldn't be. I think that really kind of hits home for me because I've always been acting. I've always been pretending to be someone I'm not. I'd also been very artistic, and I found that I was excelling in art class. And that was a massive outlet for me. In fact, it almost inspired me to be a fashion designer, but that was kind of frowned down upon because men didn't design fashions, at least as far as what I was told. We would make another move. Uh, another change in schools. Um, we moved accordingly to jobs that my stepfather had gotten. And this one took us right outside of Kalamazoo, Michigan, where I would stay for a long time. And once again, new school, um, and I started with seemingly gaining popular friends, and I felt like I could be a little bit more genuine because nobody knew of the horrid nickname I had in my last school. Um, nobody spoke the gay slurs until my femininity got the best of me and and the gay slur started and I was being harassed tremendously. There was um, a time at lunch where I was taking a bite of pizza and somebody came up behind me and shoved it in my face. I was knocked to the ground after getting off the bus, uh, scraping up my knee um, and my elbow. Um, our mailbox was stolen. It was, it, it got rough. It got really rough. <laughs> There was no sort of education in grade school, middle school, or high school about LGBTQ issues. So it was really tough. And so entering high school, boy, <laughs> I just, I, I was having a hard time. I was having a very, very hard time. So I was trying to push myself to be a little bit more masculine, a little bit more interested in, in girls. Because by this point, I knew that I was attracted to men. But I didn't know what it meant, or I knew it was wrong. And I joined a church, and a lot of my high school friends went to that church. And that was a good outlet. I definitely don't regret any of the time spent there. I just wish it had been more of a building block for me than a deterrent. And it got to be that
I would get into some more acting. My sophomore year in high school, um, I was in the musical Oklahoma. Oh wait, no, that wasn't sophomore year. That was junior year. Yes, because, okay, huh, let me retrace my steps. In the fall of my junior year, I got involved in a play called The Turn of the Screw. And I got cast in the role of Miles, which was a pretty big part. And it was dark. The whole show, like, I'm surprised. Even looking back on it all these years later, that we got away with some of the dialogue we got away with. Uh, or should I say dark innuendo? Um, I was in the village. I walked back. You, you walked all the way back to the village? I love my mind. So I walked over through the ruins of the old abbey and through the churchyard. I had a lot of my mind. A lot to think about. The time just got away with me. You, you spent half a day meditating in a cemetery? Can you think of a better place? A peaceful or a distraction? Miles, he's here again today. What? Who? He was. He's for you. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Oh, God, are you really sure? How do you know? Yes, I'm sure. She told me. But what's he want? I don't know. She didn't tell me. All I know is he's back. He's looking for you. Oh, no. Why me? Why always me? And Miles, my character, was very dark. And that was totally unlike me. And it was the very first time that I ever got lost in a character. Like, I had a hard time breaking character. We did this Q&A session where the rest of the cast would sit in the audience seats and each of us would get up on stage and the rest of the cast would ask you questions and you had to answer as your character. And yeah, and I went full in. And I had a hard time breaking out, even after my mom picked me up after play practice. I, I remember sitting there telling her, like, I can't shake this dark mood. And... And that play, that character, happens to be one of my most favorite things that I've ever done in my entire life. Because for once, I also got to be somebody totally different than who I was. And I kind of relished in that. It was great. Later on my junior year, I went on to play Ellie Hackham, or Ellie Hackham, um, <laughs> in Oklahoma the musical and I remember I was a bit dismayed because his character had a song and the director cut the song um, maybe because he didn't like my voice singing voice I don't know I've never I loved singing but I was always told I couldn't sing um, from friends. Uh, my sister and I would always put on shows for, like, family gatherings. And, and I would always choose female songs, for the most part. And portray female characters. Like, the Disney Renaissance happened in that time period, so we had The Little Mermaid, we had Aladdin, we had Beauty and the Beast. So, this whole wealth of, like, musical theater-ish kind of things really, like, started hitting me. And so when I didn't get to sing a song in Oklahoma, I was a little bit disappointed, but 
My comedy skills were pretty on point. a womanizer and well I mean he was a peddler and so he couldn't be trusted with anything um, or anyone but but yeah my my comedy skills came through and that was interesting My senior year would be wonderful. Oh, um, the bullying had pretty much subsided for the most part. I was still made fun of, and it just—it didn't seem to get me down. I was still involved in church. Um, and I auditioned for a vocal jazz ensemble, which happened at the end of my junior year, and I got in. So being told I couldn't sing was kind of like, ah, well, I showed you. Um, <laughs> So I got to be a part of this vocal jazz ensemble. I earned myself a solo and and it seemed like I was on top of the world. And everything fell apart. I decided to I wanted to get out of school one day and I had broken up with my girlfriend at the time. I just wasn't feeling great about myself. So I decided to fake faint in the middle of class, my corollaries class, and got carried down to the office where they called my mom to come get me and she took me to the ER. I thought she was just going to take me home. 
but no, she took me to the ER. So I had to keep pretending that I was unconscious. And eventually, you know, I came to it. They were doing tests. They were having a hard time trying to figure out what was going on, what was wrong. Test after test after test. And finally, they did an ultrasound on my heart and found out that I had a congenital heart defect uh, from being born prematurely. And I would need open heart surgery immediately. And that's, that meant uh, at least a month off of school. I had just auditioned for uh, the senior year musical, The Pajama Game, and I wouldn't be able to be a part of that, and that broke my heart, and all because I just wanted to get out of school. So, on my 18th birthday, I had open heart surgery, and my Corlears classmates were of great support. They came around and and we would sing a cappella some of the songs that we'd done and the attention was overwhelming and it became very addictive. And so when I was finally able to recover enough to go back to school, they had to change the high school musical uh, because there was one, only one other guy who got cast and nobody, no other guy would audition. So they had to change the whole musical because they couldn't fill my role. And so they went with your good man, Charlie Brown. So I still wanted to be a part of it, even though I couldn't be in the show. Um, so I was kind of like an assistant and as time went on, um, the role of Charlie Brown had to be recast, uh, because the student who was playing Charlie Brown, his grades weren't up to snuff and therefore he couldn't participate. So they needed a Charlie Brown and I had roughly two weeks to learn the music, learn the lines, and the show went on, and I pulled it off. So that was another huge accomplishment, and things were going to my head, like in ridiculous ways. I suddenly felt popular. I suddenly felt like there was nothing I couldn't do. Corlears was going amazing, even though I was really not performing my best. Um, and I set my sights on a girl that I hoped would be a breaking point for people to stop calling me gay and other slurs and every year the senior class uh, who takes speech does a lip sync show for the school and eventually for um, the general public and I chose a really risque song and and also invited my girlfriend up on stage to do this erotic dance with me, which gained me massive applause from the students. Um, her parents weren't too thrilled. My mom wasn't too thrilled. Um, but I was unstoppable and I graduated with honors and okay. 
it was time to start living life. And what did I have now that school was over? There wasn't corollaries. There wasn't plays and musicals. How was I going to define myself? <laughs>